Before I begin, I, I would like to say three things of thanks and recognition. First of all, I, I want to say, oh, I want to say thank you to all of you as a community. I sat yesterday when you had a discussion about transfer policy and it was the most grown up and respectable and even tempered conversation about a very difficult subject that I've seen in any of the RIR communities. And I think it's amazing that you can come into this forum with very diverse views and talk rationally about this problem without arguing. I was very impressed. The second thing is I'd like to say thank you to Oscar, who allowed me to come to the LACNIC office and do a residency. Transition of the senior management in the public body is always a very, very difficult process. And I think you've been extremely lucky with your new director. I think he's doing a phenomenal job. The, the depth of experience he's brought and the commitment that I'm seeing is phenomenal. So I think that's really lovely. But thank you for letting me come. And I'd like to say thank you and respect to all of the LACNIC staff. I think you have an amazing body of people. They are very committed. They are very welcoming. They are very open and professional. And they are really lovely to work with and talk to. So thank you for letting me be here. And thank you for being who you are. So APNIC runs a large measurement system. What we do is we perform measurements using adverts that typically are overlays on top of YouTube videos. I went out looking at what I could see in the wider network. This is from a trade show where someone was displaying a new e-ink tablet. And these are two examples of the kind of overlays of advert that you will see. And we put adverts into this system. And they let us do graphs of what we're seeing in the network because we're measuring the behavior that end users can do inside their browser. We've been doing this consistently since about 2010. We originally started using some websites and advertising through channels like that, but now we almost solely do our measurements through the advertising relationship. And we like to say that what we're doing is measuring what users really do. We're getting about 12, maybe 13 million samples a day. We actually can only use about half of these for various reasons. So we see about 6 million usable samples. And we have to do some adjustments on these numbers using ITU and UN population statistics. Now, we used to use Flash to do this measurement because most advertising exists in the Flash ecology of code. But it's not installed everywhere anymore. And a lot of people are disabling it. And it's also become an opportunistic threat that people can use to attack your machine because of loopholes in Adobe's code. And it's very intrusive, the things that happen in flash advertising. It can take over your whole computer. And Google, who are the primary advertising broker for the whole of the internet, have actually been aware of this problem. And they are very, very responsive to issues in this space because advertising is their bread and butter. It's what pays all of the wonderful things we get to do for free. And it's the foundation of all of Google's activity. They really are an, in the advertising business. And they made a decision that in the interests of the community, they were going to stop Flash. They just couldn't tolerate this. And they turned it off in crime. So that actually caused us some issues, because that meant our primary measurement vehicle had just gone overnight. But we did have a plan. We'd actually known that there was a move coming to adopt HTML5 and JavaScript to do these measures. And we'd been in development working on this. Actually, one of our test sites is a Chilean architecture discussion blog that I think operates in Santiago and is a big Spanish language architecture special interest group. And we were testing our JavaScript on that site. So you guys actually helped us learn how to do HTML5. Well, maybe not you, but the ones that are into buildings and architecture. Um, if you're interested in this technology and you have a large website, maybe a news or a weather site or a discussion group or some local regional version of eBay, we would be very happy to talk to you about conducting measurements on it, by the way. 
So we got approval from Google to modify our technology and to adopt HTML5, and we went through an assessment process, and now we use it basically exclusively for all of our measures. We think, even though there's been this discontinuity in how we measure, we think we really have a continuous flow of measurement, and we think that we can say we have some understanding of what users really see. So Flash actually wasn't so good because Flash was basically only measuring what Windows users see. And if I look out in this room, I see a lot of glowing white apples. So I think I can tell straight away that Windows isn't telling us about what a lot of people do. And it certainly doesn't tell us about what goes on with these devices, mobiles, because very few of them ran Flash. So because of these limitations, we didn't have much insight into what the modern internet was actually doing because we didn't see what mobile devices did. Well, with HTML5, we now see that because we finally have a technique that can measure into the mobile domain, which means we've now got new information about what's going on in the network. Often, when we talk about our measurement, we describe it in ways that talk about the relative rankings of ISPs. And I want to be very clear that although we use that language in ways that are like market share and relative market share, we're not actually directly measuring the market. We're measuring eyeballs. I think they're still attached. So the eyeball measurement is about what people see. It's not about how many you have exactly, but based on an assumption about random placement of adverts, it's actually quite a good measure for the segment of the business in the internet, which is dealing with large volumes of people. We do see some corporate networks and transit networks. We see some quite interesting places. Um, we see inside Google's own corporate structure. We see inside Facebook. But we try not to focus on that because we're more interested in the mass of users that are actually the customers in your environment because they're the primary drivers of what's going on and the primary concern in the V6 transition. So let's go see what we can see. Can we see some significant deployments? I'm going to start talking about a case in the UK and the reason is that Britain has actually been quite slow with IPv6 uptake but there's one provider there, a cable provider, that recently made a decision they were going to do a complete national deployment. So from this chart, you can see that Sky is in the top set. They're actually about 20% of the market. And in the space of less than three months, they've already achieved almost 15% penetration of V6. These guys are phenomenal. They are converting somewhere around 80,000 customers a week. And the reason is they have a very strong centralized network management system and operations framework. I actually asked them about their technology, saying, I guess you did London, and then you moved on to Manchester. And they said, no, 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 it's not like that. We know every individual customer's version of hardware and software. So what we decided is we'd do the version 1.6 boxes first, and when they worked, we'd move on to the version 1.7. So those 80,000 customers weren't only in London, they were everywhere in the network, because we could provision every individual customer to do dual stack. So, their deployment has been really accelerated. If you look at what the technology is underneath that, the non-mobile sector, the desktop, it's tracking fairly solidly, but a bit of tail off. And if you look at mobile, it's tracking very slightly ahead of their average figure. That's interesting. We think it may be because desktops includes a lot of legacy systems that aren't 4 and 6 enabled. And most of the handsets that pop up on Wi-Fi Android, iOS, they mostly all have IPv6 capability baked in. And if you go a little further and you differentiate between Android and iOS, you can see that really they're broadly doing the same thing. So in this example, what we can say is when you do true dual stack in a cable network, there's really no technology discrimination. Everybody gets to do v6. And we know that this is what these guys have done. Now this is in terms of the effect on the market in Britain, this is hugely significant. Britain is going to be at 20% penetration by the end of 2016. They're going to become one of the powerhouse IPv6 economies in Europe. And that is off the back of one ISP. So what are the other ISPs going to do? 
Okay, so another one that I would like to talk about is about the effect of iOS and the decision inside Apple not to support translation technology. The Apple software designers made a very conscious decision that they were going to stick with Pure V6 and not support translation. This means if a network provider is depending on using translation technology, Apple devices won't participate in that dialogue. They won't see any of that behavior. So where there is a significant use of iOS, but people are using 464 Translate, we know that we're not going to see the iOS. So can we actually see that in the graphs? Okay, let's take T-Mobile, because we know this provider has used 464 Translate. And we also know it's a cellular provider, so we should expect to see a lot of hands handheld devices. So this is their overall level of penetration. They've had a nice, smooth, steady uptake of V6. They're actually already up at above 70%. That is phenomenally high penetration. And this is the level of desktop device that we see. And it's not surprising they don't typically do V6 because very few laptops and PCs come with a Wi-Fi chip. So these devices are almost exclusively using MiFi standalone Wi-Fi units, and most of them don't actually provide V6 transport. So if we look at the mobile device sector, that's tracking almost directly their level of V6 penetration. But when you drill down and separate iOS and Android, there is virtually no iOS visible from this provider. It just doesn't get offered the V6 service. Whereas all of that is being provided by the Android devices. So we have two things that we can draw from this. One is that we can absolutely say, hand on heart, 464 Translate works. It works. If you have a desire to explore this technology space, you should do that knowing that one of the largest telcos in America has successfully deployed this technology. And now that the main content that people are going to, Google, Cloudflare, Akamai, now that they have dual stack capability, if you do this, most of your users who are on 6 are going to go to this content over 6. So the pressure on your translation component that's providing CGN and MAP is actually going to be fairly reduced from this. But the problem is, if you sell a lot of iOS devices, a lot of Apple, this technology doesn't work for you. Okay, so let's look in Korea. Now, Korea is fascinating. These guys had a national plan to deploy broadband, and they went round the housing projects with a giant roll of cable and a box with a thousand CPEs, and they just marched into every house, and they gave them broadband five years before everyone else had moved there. And for about five years, they were on the top of the world broadband rankings for penetration. They got every household online. But the problem is, they didn't buy commodity hardware. They went to one of the Korean chai balls, the industrial combines and they asked them to make a special device that would be cheap and that's what they got a cheap device that can never be upgraded in the field to do IPv6 so they have this massive network that just can't do v6 but their cellular providers are not behind that technology and one of them SK Telecom who is in the top six set decided to move and you can already see that they've achieved about 10% penetration Oh dear. Are we back? Are we nearly back? We're back. So these guys, here's their penetration figure. It's fairly low, but they're basically doing this on a new handset rollout. And here's their desktop device. They don't have many because after all they're cellular. And here you can see iOS isn't present and Android is the main part of their signal. So again, we have this really strong signal. We know when translation technology is being used. OK, can we see it elsewhere? So let's have a look at four providers in the USA. This is AT&T. That's pretty clear. They're not doing translation because everyone gets broadly the same service. This is AT&T Mobility, which is a different AS inside the AT&T family. It's fairly clear in that that they are using some class of translation technology. So not all of AT&T is doing the same thing. This is Verizon. Um, they're obviously not using a translation technology. They have a slightly lower signal for desktops, which is understandable because they're primarily in the cellular space. This is Comcast, 
huge cable provider, no cellular, really well grouped. They get consistent behavior. And this is Sprint. Now, it's a noisy signal, but we think that we're seeing some class of translation behavior. We don't know. It could be that they're managing an APN handout. OK, let's look elsewhere worldwide. So this is China. It is notoriously difficult to measure what is going on in China. But we think there may be a signal of move there happening in Android. This is Orange Poland. And I wanted to say, yes, Orange has definitely moved, and they're using a translation system. But when you look at the whole data, something went really crazy in the measurement system, and then it crashed to the floor. And I have a feeling that either they've changed their mind about what they're doing, or we had a problem in data collection. OK, so the real reason I'm here is to talk about you guys. Now, I want to reassure you that when you see some rankings and some orderings, it's not meant to be a criticism of how you choose to conduct your business or your network. I'm not in this community, and I don't have the right to come and tell you how to do things. I just want to observe what we measure in our system and give you a chance to think about it. So please, don't, don't overreact to the rankings that you see. This is the overall chart of the top IPv6-enabled economies as we see it. What we've done is factor, based on the ITU statistics for users and population, what percentage of the economy is potentially capable of doing V6 in a ranking. And this is an extremely impressive list of economies. If you compare this to Western Europe, there is actually an amazingly strong commitment in this region to exploring V6 networks. It's phenomenal. I and mean, seriously, guys, you are doing really well. Really well. This is Uruguay. Um, the figures on the side reveal that although there's a sharp uptick, the overall level of penetration is really very low. So if we look at the V6 capability, this is the signal of an economy which is still essentially one that is based in V4, but there's a strong sense the academic community is exploring the technology. So the predominant signal we get here is a very old established AS, which is the university there that's got quite a widespread deployment. But when you, uh-oh, did I miss press again? Sorry. When you reorder this data by the effective eyeball share measure, you can see that the rankings have massively changed. There is also a signal here that Antel is still very, very dominant in terms of the percentage of the market. Now, for a lot of us, that's a sign of, oh, they're an old school, they're a monopoly provider. But you know, someone in the LACNIC office talked to me about Uruguay. You guys have 60% fiber to the home. You have free ADSL in Uruguay if you are unable to buy the, the, the basic service. You get 512K for free. You were one of the first economies in the Americas to deploy digital telephony and subscriber trunk dialing. So, yes, you might be old school in terms of the predominance of one provider, but you have better infrastructure than I do in my G20 economy. Our national broadband network is a complete mess, and you guys have 60% penetration. I'm really impressed. Okay, so let's look in Venezuela. Venezuela is also a very low level of deployment. But I believe this is a national research institute. I think I have that right. Please correct me if I'm wrong. They're actually very V6 capable, although obviously from a very small sample base, as is the Central University and another research foundation. It's when you go to the rankings by eyeball share, approximating to your sense of market penetration, you can see that there's no significant V6 deployment happening in the technical space. OK, this is Chile. There is actually a bit of signal there of something happening. And this one is quite interesting because the predominant V6 is coming, it's coming out of Telefonica. However, when you sort by ranking of eyeballs, it's a different Telefonica AS which is being used for the predominant part of the market. So Telefonica has V6, but they haven't turned it on. OK, this is Ecuador. Really quite a nice number. 5% is absolutely up at world level at this point. This is quite a strong signal coming in from the academic community. 
But there is also this large provider with a very, very large sample count. And when we sort, we can see that they are actually the predominant eyeball percentage. They have nearly half the market share, and they're showing strong signs of V6 capability. So this is a signal of just how many people in an economy can actually substantively have V6 capability when the market dominant player, the people we see in eyeballs, chooses to move. This is Argentina. Again, there's a bit of an uptick there, but if you look at the axis, it's a very low base. Interestingly, Argentina's academic community doesn't seem to be very predominant at this stage. And when we sort by eyeball share, there is no significant V6 capability. Now, I have no doubt Argentine telecommunications industry are capable of doing this when they think the moment is right. So it's not to say the Argentinian community can't, it's just the observation they haven't. Brazil, on the other hand, 200 million people, Brazil is showing an extremely strong signal that V6 is real, V6 is happening. So this is the ASN view, and again we get the very strong signal that the high capability is happening in the academic community. There's a lot of penetration into the university system. These are very high numbers. If you went to these institutions, you would expect to get dual stack service when you are online on their network. When you sort by eyeball share, we get these players that are somewhere around half of the market collectively showing signs of having moved, and it's a lovely high consistent number. This is a very, very strong signal that some serious players with a lot of eyeballs have decided it's time to make a move. I don't know anything about the way your economies work. I don't know how you guys discuss this or how you decide to do this, but I've got to say, this is a realistic and real movement. This is a strong signal. If we look in Peru, Peru looks flat, but that's because they've actually achieved massively. Telefonica in Peru, interesting, Telefonica, obviously running as separate divisions in each economy, because it's quite different what we see from the different branches of the Telefonica brand. But Telefonica has made a very commanding move here, 17%. And when we saw it by the eyeball share, they stay in the top ranking. So this is overwhelmingly the most significant movement in that economy. Amazing stuff. Colombia, I should pay respect to the local hosts. I love your food. So this one is kind of good and kind of bad because the reality is that there actually is not a significant market move. And there actually isn't a significant signal in the academic community which is kind of a shame because that's traditionally where the initial capacity is. Now these guys, we saw very few samples from them. But I went and looked at the website, and I believe this is a new entrant in the Columbia market space offering KU band satellite VSAT internet services. They haven't really had a long presence here. They only appear to have started up in this game recently. But they're offering 50% V6 capability, which suggests to me maybe they V6 enabled their SAT transport. So when you sort by market, sorry, eyeball share, caught myself there, when you sort by eyeball share, you do get a very strong signal that most of the activity in Colombia is still on V4. But I'm really encouraged by that, because I think the SAT sector and the cellular sector are the ones that are going to be interesting for the question that's on the table at um, IGF. Where are the next billion users coming from? And the obvious problem with the next billion users is that they're in the places that it's hard to get technology to right now. So I suspect this movement is quite interesting. Mexico is another one that is kind of strange. Um, there is a very small amount with no clear signal of movement. In percentage terms, it's low. I, I'm sorry, Oscar. I don't want to disrespect your, your patrimony. But I think we have to accept that this is still essentially about the academic community in Mexico. When we go to the eyeball rankings, this is not a story that appears to be significant. Now, this is a very highly developed economy integrated in um, the North American free trade region. They have massive cellular and, and broadband penetration. I think they're also well provisioned in V4 addresses. So, for whatever reason, this is just not yet a significant movement in Mexico. Maybe it's going to come later. So, in general sense, there wasn't any strong sign in the Caribbean region, the membership that you guys have. There was nothing I could say as a signal there that it's happening. 
There were very limited signals in Central America. There are signs in Guatemala and Mexico, but it is still essentially about tertiary education. South America, there is a really strong signal that you guys have made economically strong decisions to move to V6-enabled networks. Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, this is real. The KU band signal in Colombia, I just think it's fascinating because once you make a satellite V6-enabled, you've potentially enabled everywhere. So that is really interesting to me. The other major economies, Uruguay, Chile, Venezuela, Argentina, I just don't see it. I'd love to say that there's something there. It's just not visible in the figures the way we're seeing them. Now, we believe, based on conversations, that there isn't a lot of Apple being bought in the general marketplace. I know that's kind of funny, because I'm looking out at all of the glowing Apples that are here, but you guys are unusual. Customers in your economies typically are looking at what we could call the Apple tax. They have a uniform flat price. And if you translate into local economy or the blue dollar in Argentina, this is not a cheap device. So based on that theory that there's a flat price for an Apple device, there shouldn't be many out there. And there should be a lot more Android because they're incredibly price variant. You can buy a $25 phone, you can buy a $1,000 phone. What do you want to buy? It will still run Android. So we expected, based on that, that there would be kind of signs of this because with the whole BRICS thing and the economic relationships between South America and China and Korea and the emergence of this technology, we kind of thought that we would see the signal. But when I look into what you guys are doing, I took the top set, the list of ASs that are in the top set, and looked at the transitions. There's no sign you're using 464. You've done true dual stack, which is great, but surprising. I didn't see it in Ecuador either. It's just a flat, uniform dual stack. Didn't see it in Brazil. Didn't see it in the other place in Brazil. So I was kind of surprised, because if you don't have a lot of iPhones sold in the continent, then you have an opportunity to use 464 translation. And I say this because it can make economic sense. It's really easy to deploy. You've got a strong signal that other providers internationally, like T-Mobile, have been prepared to do this. We know that it's a technology that can work. It reduces pressure on your v4 address pool. It transits your custom base to use v6 natively but we're not seeing any signs that it's happening in this region. Now, I can kind of take a step back and say, hey, that's fine, because translation is like, don't go there. But that's, that's the other view. There's this other part of me that says, if it's working in these other economies, and you guys don't have a lot of Apple devices, maybe it could work for you. So, in conclusion, what I want to stress is, there is significant nation-scale V6 network building going on here. It is world-class. It isn't consistent. It's not happening everywhere in the region. It varies by economy, but millions of the users in South Central America are already on V6. We know the tertiary networks are part of this story. We know the research linkages into public benefit networks are part of this story. You're not doing translation technology. But you could do. And we think that we have a good insight. We think we're seeing what's going on with this change to technology. And we think we understand what's going on. We like what we're seeing. And we think that using some of these translation techniques could be good for you because it can help to reduce pressures on V4 and actually make the transition through to V6 work. But it is obvious it just won't work in IOS. I'd like to repeat my thanks to Oscar for letting me come and spend time in the LACNIC community. It's been really lovely. And to Carlos for hosting me in the research team. And also the people who fund the work that we're doing. Google, ISC, the RIPE NCC have all been hugely helpful with this. Love to talk to anyone who's interested. Thank you very much.